In December of 1900, a conservative German scientist named Max Planck published a paper which included, according to the Nobel Prize winning physicist Max Born, quote, the most revolutionary idea which has ever shaken physics. For in this paper, Planck assumed that energy came in little energy packets. Why did he do it and why was it so revolutionary? Great questions, let's ask Planck. No, not with a Ouija board silly. Why don't we just read his autobiography in his other papers and see what Planck himself said? And that's exactly what I did. Ready to learn not only how, but why quantum mechanics was started? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. It all started when Planck was just two years old and another German scientist named Gustav Kirchhoff came up with a theoretical puzzle about heat and light. See, Kirchhoff had just accidentally discovered that elements will absorb exactly the same frequency of light that they emit. Therefore, in 1860, Kirchhoff published a paper where he imagined a perfect object that could completely absorb every frequency of radiation that hit it, and therefore could emit all frequencies. Kirchhoff called this object a black body and predicted that the amount of light a black body will emit does not depend on the material, but only on the temperature and the frequency of the light. Don't get too distracted by the word black in black body. It just means if it's cool, it's perfectly black, not that it can't emit any light. Anyway, the black body radiation problem became one of the great unanswered questions in science, and every great scientist tried their hand at solving it. However, it took over 30 years till 1894, until a friend of Planck's named Wilhelm Wein came up with an expression for black body radiation that seemed like it was a pretty good fit and was generally accepted as true. The only problem with Wein's equation is that it was derived from experiment, not theory. By this time, Max Planck was the head of theoretical physics at the University of Berlin. And as basically Germany's sole pure theoretician, Planck decided it was important for him to derive Wein's equations from the basic theories of physics. This was not an easy task and it took him five years till 1899 when he triumphantly produced his results. He thought the case was closed. And for a while, this black body radiation equation was called the Planck-Wein law. However, nature had another idea for another friend of Planck's had found a way to measure low energy infrared waves and found that at relatively low energies, the Planck-Wein equation didn't work. This friend gave Planck a heads up and he quickly made a new equation, quote, which as far as I can see at the moment, fits the observational data. Planck politely titled his paper, quote, an improvement of Wein's equation, although it was a totally new equation, although it does look like Wein's equation at high frequencies. This new Planck equation seemed to work perfectly, but Planck wasn't happy. It was just a lucky intuition, just that Wein had done six years earlier, and it wasn't based on physics principles. Planck recalled, quote, for this reason, on the very day I formulated this law, I began to devote myself to the task of investing it with true meaning. For six years, I had struggled with a black body theory. I knew the problem was fundamental and I knew the answer. I had to find a theoretical explanation at any cost. So in an act of desperation, Planck used something he hated, statistical mechanics. Now statistical mechanics had been around since 1859, when James Clerk Maxwell of Maxwell's equations decided to study gases by using statistics. The general idea is gases are filled with a ridiculous number of atoms moving at different speeds in different directions and in order to study them, you need to study what they're doing on average, which is why you need statistics and probability. Five years after Maxwell wrote his paper about statistical mechanics, a 20-year-old German scientist named Ludwig Boltzmann read Maxwell's paper and decided to devote his life to this research and became Germany's main champion of the existence of atoms. Max Planck admitted that for most of his career, he had been, quote, hostile to the atomic theory, which was the foundation of Boltzmann's entire research. Why did Planck hate statistical mechanics? Well, it wasn't the math, like me. It was because of what statistical mechanics said about something called the second law of thermodynamics, or entropy. See, Planck had gotten his PhD at age 19 in the second law of thermodynamics. 
The second law can be written in many, many, many forms, but the basic idea is things can't become more ordered or less messy by themselves. Physicists call the messiness of the system the entropy. So the second law of thermodynamics can also be written, the entropy in a closed system cannot be less than zero. However, if you believed in statistical mechanics, then the atoms could become more ordered. It was just really, really unlikely. In other words, the second law wasn't as much a law as a statistical certainty. James Maxwell elegantly put it this way, quote, the second law of thermodynamics has the same degree of truth as a statement that if you throw a cup of water into the sea, you can't get the same cup of water out again. To Planck, that statistical certainty never seemed good enough. However, desperate times called for desperate measures, and basically holding his nose, he dived into the inner relationship between probability and entropy. Quote, in other words, to pursue the line of thought inaugurated by Boltzmann. Now, Boltzmann had been writing about an idea that atoms and gases can have different arrangements to produce their average energy. And he had given the letter W for the German word for probability for the measure of how many different arrangements there could be. It makes sense that the entropy or the messiness, which is given the letter S, would relate to the amount of ways you can arrange your materials, W, but how? Planck recalled, quote, since the entropy S is an additive magnitude, but the probability W is a multiplicative one, I simply postulated that S equals K log W, where K is a universal constant. This became known as Boltzmann's entropy equation, and K became known as Boltzmann's constant, even though both were defined by Planck. In fact, this equation, S equals K log W, is actually written on Boltzmann's tombstone. Ironically, Boltzmann didn't determine his constant. Planck did. But then Planck had a problem. He couldn't seem to get the equation to work without another constraint. Because if the energy is, quote, considered to be a continuously divisible quantity, this distribution is possible in infinitely many ways. Planck therefore imagined that the energy came in little energy elements with an energy that equaled a constant h times the frequency of light. In his paper, Planck said it clearly, quote, the most essential point of the whole calculation is to consider the energy E to be composed of a very definite number of equal parts. This is the delineation between modern and classical physics. Let's take a moment to appreciate what a strange and radical idea this is. Think of a water wave or a sound wave. They do not come in little packages. They are vibrations of water or molecules, where the more the water or molecules vibrate, the more energy the wave has. Planck was creating a brand new thing in physics, a wave packet. Five years later, Einstein called them quanta of energy, although they're currently called photons. This is the birth of the quantum. It's a really, really big deal. However, Planck didn't realize what he'd done to the whole nature of physics. Quantizing energy was to Planck, quote, a purely formal assumption, and I didn't give it much thought. Instead, he assumed that he could massage his new theory into classical physics and spent well over a decade trying to distance himself from his own idea. Other physicists politely ignored him and most believed the competing theory that used statistical mechanics in a different way, but didn't require energy to be in little packages. The only problem with this other method is that as the frequency went up, you get more energy states without any quantum limitations. So that as you went to the ultraviolet range, the radiation went up exponentially, a situation poetically called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Some people tried to solve this problem with a fudge factor or saying it didn't work at high frequencies for reasons. One of the inventors of the equation said it was fine, this is fine, as a catastrophe was happening, but just unevenly and very, very slowly. By the way, Planck thought that that man was an idiot, writing Vine that he, quote, is the model of a theorist as he should not be. He just ignores the facts if they don't fit. However, at the time, a theory that didn't fit the facts seemed far preferable to a theory that didn't fit classical physics. Even a young college graduate named Albert Einstein had, quote, mixed feelings about Planck's paper. Then in May of 1901, 
Einstein read a paper about something called the photoelectric effect by Philip Leonard, and it all made sense. Planck's equation was not a formal assumption. It was a discovery about the fundamental nature of light. Einstein wrote his girlfriend, quote, I've just read a wonderful paper by Leonard, and under the influence of this beautiful piece, I'm filled with such happiness and joy that I absolutely must share it with you. By 1905, Einstein and his dear kitten became the first people to actually use Planck's equation to describe what light was. And well over a hundred years later, this paper is still considered correct. Einstein actually won his Nobel Prize due to the photoelectric effect. And I will get to that. But first I want to take a little step back and talk about Philip Leonard. Why was he studying the photoelectric effect? What is the photoelectric effect? And what did Leonard think the photoelectric effect was? And that is next time on The Lightning Tamers. Thanks for watching my video. If you haven't seen my last one about Kirchhoff and Bunsen and spectroscopy and finding gold in the sun, you should really check it out. It's one of my favorite stories. Also, I have another video about James Clerk Maxwell discovering Maxwell's equations. And if you haven't seen that one, I think you should check it out. He's so charming. I really like him and I think you will like him too, even if you suffered with his equations. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Even better, share it on social media with your friends, with your teachers, with your enemies, with your students. Always appreciate it and really helps me out. If you really want to be a help, consider being a patron. There's a link down below and you get the videos a day early. You get to be part of my community. You get to see extra videos that I make and you get my everlasting love and affection. And that's basically all you get, but that's worth it, right? Okay, well, either way, have a great day.